In these troubling times, today I wanted to talk to you all about a multiplayer game. But not a multiplayer game you can actually play. No, this game has long since had its server shut down. But to this day, it remains my favorite multiplayer experience of all time. I'm talking, of course, about Chrome Hounds. Looking back, Chrome Hounds was received with a resounding meh from critics. It currently sits at a 71 on Metacritic, and according to the game's producer, Justin Lambros, it ended up selling just under half a million copies. But today, I'm going to argue that this was due to the game simply being a decade ahead of its time. There was no game like it before, and almost nothing since its release. Which seems crazy to me, as the game had a small but incredibly dedicated fanbase. And considering how many people seem to be clamoring for a new mech game all the time, it seems like a slam dunk for a publisher to invest in a sequel. As always, if you enjoy this video, please consider subscribing to our channel and leaving a comment down below. So, why did Chrome Hounds fail to reach success? Why do people love it so much? And what can you do to fill the hole in your heart left by the game disappearing? As I said before, Chrome Hounds was a game a decade ahead of its time. Published by Sega and developed by From Software, yes, that From Software, but before their breakout success of the Dark Souls franchise, although after their other customizable mech combat series, Armored Core. They wanted to create a game with more appeal to the Western market, which is why they brought in people from outside of Japan to help work on the game. And they also had to work very closely with Xbox to get the game's absolutely revolutionary multiplayer mode to work. Let me break down what made the multiplayer mode so unique and amazing, and why I still think about it to this day. And please, remember while I explain this, that this game came out in the year 2006. And in regards to that, please forgive me for the quality of some of this footage. This game came out even before YouTube was a popular service, and it was hard to even find footage in 720p. Chrome Hounds is set in an alternate reality future where resources have become scarce. More specifically, oil, which as a game coming out in 2006, resonated pretty hard. Also in this world, there is another small continent that doesn't exist in ours. It's loaded with resources, so naturally everybody wants a piece of that pie. And at the time Chrome Hounds takes place, it's split into three regions, each controlled by a world power or faction. The Democratic Republic of Tarakia is influenced more by the United States and Western Europe, the Kingdom of Salkar is influenced by the emergent Middle Eastern powers, and the Republic of Murskosh was influenced by the Soviets. You see, in this world, the Cold War never truly ended, and at some point, one of the world powers activated a weapon that essentially covered the world with permanent cloud coverage, preventing radars and other communication systems from working as well. Which, thinking back, probably doesn't hold water scientifically, but the way it works out for the gameplay is absolutely fantastic, and I'll explain that in a minute. At the start of each multiplayer season, which was an all-out war between the three factions, you got to pick one of the powers to serve as a mercenary for. You'd then get to vote in an election for a few different political candidates. And these would have real implications on the game. Say you voted for a politician who favored spending on research and development. Well, by the end of the war, you might be able to purchase a new part that is exclusive to the members of that faction. I remember one point in time when Sal Carr suddenly had a boss mission on their territory. If you loaded into this map on the opposing side, you got a unique cutscene showcasing a huge monster mech, and suddenly, you and your squad had to take it down. Stuff like this was super cool, adding another layer of variety to the game. But what about the actual gameplay? One interesting thing about Chrome Hound's multiplayer is that it forced you to be a member of a clan. You literally couldn't play without one. Then, you and your squad would look at the overworld map and pick a battlefield to go to, then, the game would match you with a group from the other faction, and you would duke it out. Most encounters ended up simply being deathmatches, but you could also destroy the opponent's base to win as well. This did lead to some pretty annoying metas, including the infamous Pile Scout build, which was fast and could destroy a base pretty quickly if not taken care of. You could target individual parts on your opponent's hound, and if they sustained enough damage, they would fall off or become unusable, which could potentially leave you completely crippled. You had to account for bullet drop, and depending on the distance, you'd have to seriously lead your aim in order to hit an opponent. Whichever side won the match, points would then be awarded to their overall victory on that battleground, until eventually the map would get overrun, and the front line of the battlefield would move slightly. Eventually, this could lead to a fight on one of the country's capitals, and potentially their country would have to surrender. The mercenaries allied with the losing country could then jump ship to their conqueror, or try and take the capital back and reclaim their ground, but this rarely ever succeeded. Remember how I mentioned earlier that radar and communications were difficult in the world of Chrome Hounds? 
Well, one of the most unique things this game did was prevent players from speaking to each other unless they were in range of a captured comms tower. Imagine that. One of the biggest innovations of the Xbox 360 was how simple it was to connect with other people and communicate via voice using your Xbox 360 headset. This game threw that out the window, making it so you had to actively control parts of the map in order to coordinate with your team. Venturing outside the range of your comms towers meant that you were going silent and couldn't request backup or report any enemy movements. It was an amazing innovation, and I'm surprised we haven't really seen it implemented in other games since. Obviously, one of the most fun parts of the game was customizing your mech, or hound as they were called in the game. Ultimately, the possible builds were endless, but they were divided into six major categories. Soldier, which is a class more based on frontline combat. Sniper, the opposite of this, attacking foes from afar. Scout, built for quick movement and usually not too much else. Commander, a class mainly revolving around having a built-in comms unit on the mech, so your team would start the battle having access to some form of communication. Defender, which is kind of like the soldier build, but usually slower and more defensive based. Go figure. And Heavy Gunner, more focused on long range attacks with absolutely devastating damage. But you are usually constrained by slow move speeds and not actually being able to see your opponents. You see, the maps were big enough that you would actually have to have an ally tell you which grid the enemy was in, and you would try and aim your entire salvo there, usually praying that the area of effect on some of your attacks would hit an opponent. Personally, I never played much of this class because I found it a little tedious to play, but the idea of it is absolutely fascinating. Most people tended to rely on some form of hybrid between two classes. My personal favorite was a combo between the commander class with long range sniper weapons. I wasn't super fast, but I was able to lie in the back lines and call out enemy positions to the rest of my team and provide support fire. If I went down, it meant we would lose some communication range, so it was important that I stayed alive. Each of the wars could take weeks and had a cap of up to two months. But it felt incredibly rewarding when your country won the war. After the war ended, each person had a day or so to pick a new country, and then the map would reset, starting everything from scratch. In my mind, this would work so well in the context of a modern games as a service type model. Have the wars act like seasons, adding new goodies or other changes when things start up again. And with the added aspect of having players elect politicians, they could help the devs pick which things they could add to the game moving forward. It's because of this, and all of these reasons, that I still think about Chrome Hounds to this day. I have an extremely vivid memory of a time when I was a little bit older and I was telling my friend about how amazing Chrome Hounds multiplayer was. And to show him, I loaded up the game and realized the servers had been shut down for about five years at that point. It was devastating. There was a giant mech-shaped hole in my heart. But it turns out I wasn't the only one. A small group of Chromehound fans started making a spiritual successor to the game called Mav in 2012. I remember hearing about the game and giving them my 20 bucks to see if I could get my fix. And at the time, the game was more than a little rough. But while researching this video, I decided to check it out again, and wow, this game has come a long way. And it certainly has captured a lot of the feel of Chrome Hounds. Even the fan community for Mav echoes the original game, being smaller, but dedicated. I had questions in the game's official Discord, and everybody was pretty keen to help out. This game checks off pretty much all the boxes I wanted to when it comes to helping me relive my Chrome Hounds memories. I instantly found myself tabbing between weapons, slightly panicking when parts of my body were destroyed, and relishing in creating a mech that fits my playstyle. This isn't to say it's perfect. The game still has some polishing to do, and as of writing, there's a bug that prevents controllers from being used, so you'll have to stick with mouse and keyboard. And there aren't dedicated servers, so you'll have to hop into the Discord and ask people if they want to play and can host. But for now, the developers, Bombdog Studios, have definitely spent their time building an incredible base for the game, which offers tons of customization, including over 400 parts. It is the same six distinctions of classes from the original game, and just last month, they confirmed their next update would be their 1.0 release, including a full story mode as well as an online multiplayer mode, mimicking the Neuroimus War from Chrome Hounds with at least three factions and a changing map over time. Needless to say, I am greatly anticipating this update. Currently, you can buy the game on Bombdog's website for 20 bucks, and I'll include a link to that down below. And there you have it, my complete thoughts on Chrome Hounds and the underrated, flawed masterpiece of a multiplayer mode that it included. Do you have strong memories of this game? Or is there another game that you felt went underappreciated and then had its online server shut down that you might like to see us do a video on? Let me know in the comments down below. 
And if you enjoy hearing me talk about video games, consider checking out our Twitch, where we do a live talk show every week about the current news in gaming. Or even hop over to our Discord, where you can chat with us about anything. And last but not least, if you are able to, please consider supporting us over on our Patreon. As always, thank you very much for watching, and have a wonderful day.